One of the more common problems that we come across in our clinics is low back pain. Uh, it's a very, very, very common problem um, and there can be a whole load of reasons for it. Now, I'm not going to sit here and uh, send you all into a deep sleep listening to my monotone, listing the number of reasons or pathologies that are involved in low back pain or lumbar pain. Um, I could read you off a list of that. It's, it's pretty long. Uh, as I said, I'll probably end up with an audience of none very, very quickly. But there can be a number of causes. It, it, it can range from problems that are from trigger points to disc problems, muscular strains, stiffness of joints, lack of use, all sorts of dysfunctions that can cause uh, low back pain or lumbar pain. And there could be a combination of those, and very often it is a combination of, of things that cause low back pain. So sometimes it might, be, it might help to look at it from a, a perspective, a little bit of a different perspective, rather than looking at it from a, a perspective of, uh, oh, she's got a disc pain, or we've got a, a, a trigger point problem. We could maybe look at it from a, a more of a perspective of uh, movements and the structures and causes or the structures and why those structures are causing pain and is that related to some sort of movement dysfunction. Now as a physiotherapist obviously I'm, I'm very involved in the sort of movement dysfunction type of thing but uh, it, it's, it's quite important. Often people will, will, will come in with low back pain, they will have their particular diagnosis. That particular diagnosis itself can cause problems, especially when you're looking at it from the psycho, uh, biosocial or biopsychosocial, or however people are calling it, uh, aspect, which is very relevant. Uh, but there can be physical problems that we need to address, and and one of those, one of the ways that we can look at it is by looking at the the structure and the reasons those structures are causing problems, and then the mechanism of pain and then possibly any contributing factors rather than looking at a contributing factor and saying that is the cause of this this and this or a particular pathology it's very often and i know certainly when i was a new physiotherapist somebody would come in and say i've got a back pain and you would look at them and they would say uh, i can't bend forwards i can't bend backwards and say, you've got a disc problem or a facet joint problem uh, and that's because your shoe height's not right or you're a bit crooked or you've got a scoliosis or, or various things. Now, those things may be relevant. They may contribute to the problem, but they're not going to be the be-all and end-all of it. In fact, uh, Paul Ingram, when he talks about the sort of crookedness and, and asymmetries, you can't often treat those very easily anyway. And they may not be the main, main cause of the problem. But maybe if we look at it as, as I said, look at the structure, look at why that structure is causing a problem and mechanisms of pain involved in that. And then we can treat accordingly. And one of the things that would be very quite important in this is um, basically restriction versus sort of give. Um, I think it was Mark Comerford, uh, well, one of the courses I did in his muscle imbalance courses, that was talking about this restriction versus give. If we look at our, our little spine here, and we've got all these lovely little facet joints running down the outside of the spine, and the other joint obviously is the, the joint of the disc. Now, those joints themselves can cause a problem. Those joints in causing a problem can irritate the nerve, which can cause some sciatic problems. Those joints themselves can cause muscles such as quadratus lumborum and the erector spinae to contract and not release and cause trigger points, which will be cause problems. So we've got a number of structures that are involved there. And then we could look at them from the point of view, are they restricted or are they um, too flexible, too, got too much give? And, and this, is what, this is one of the things that people often don't look at because it's not easy to see. You can only really basically see how the, uh, the client or the patient is move, moving. And that may give us some clues as to what's going on. 
but we can look at the sort of stability of the spine versus the mobility of the spine and then there may be a connection to the other structures the muscular structures and possible trigger points within stiff facet joints can we do something about that this lack of movement obviously all of that coming together may cause a sort of a, a, a element of fear a pain mechanism an effective pain mechanism the psychobiosocial model is very very important it, it needs to be considered it's kind of becoming a bit of a sort of uh, a manual therapy or physiotherapy or chiropractor or whatever manual therapist is, is the better term for it uh, against the sort of so psychobiosocial and really they really need to meet in the middle and anybody worth their salt will be doing that so having considered all those elements whether it's a stiff facet joint causing trigger points lack of movement or is it because a facet joint or an element of the spine is not well supported by the musculature around it those things can then be addressed through our various treatment techniques and we have loads to, to help us um, achieve the most optimal outcome or the best outcome for our patient so for example somebody comes in and we were talking restriction versus uh, stability somebody comes in with a stiff back maybe they've bent forward or they've been in a, a, a position where they've been uncomfortable for a long time the muscles have contracted the facet joints have become stiff the muscles have become contracted and they're not releasing enough so we've got trigger points and there's the element of 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 fear and a diagnosis of uh you've got a, a prolapsed disc because uh, somebody was given a ct now they could very well have had the ct or the mri years before when they didn't have pain and it would have been negative but because they've got pain now and they've had this ct that's their diagnosis maybe it's better to say it put it this way somebody could have had a prolapsed disc or managed quite happily without any problems for a great many of years suddenly something happens that causes their pain they get a diagnosis of from an mri or a ct of a prolapsed disc that feeds into their their belief system of what's going on and what they can and cannot do and therefore they do not do certain things because of all the myriad of experts that we have out there and i don't necessarily mean actual medical experts and anybody from uncle joe down the road that had a slip disc giving his information and all of that works into the physical aspect of it as well which could be trigger points that just will not release and become chronic lack of movement stiff joint and a, and a facet joint that doesn't move now that could be the restricted joint equally there could be somebody that's not pretty much like me um not really a great sport not really a great sportsman um carrying a little bit of weight there's quite a lot of instability around their spine and the muscles then are working to try and guard or prevent that in a less than optimal fashion and subsequently the, um, the muscles will develop trigger points that need to be released uh, the joint is too mobile so it needs exercises to try and, try and stabilize it as much as possible and obviously we need to tap into the psychologically effective element of that to explain to them that this you, know, you don't need to worry about it it's not a problem again suddenly they get a, a ct or a, an mri that says you've got a disc and, and that may not be relevant at all because for years and years and years and years they had a sleep disc they just didn't know about it and that then feeds on to how we can treat and if it's a restricted problem we could go on and uh, maybe mobilize the joints using the myriad of techniques we, we we have at our hands people that are qualified such as chiropractors osteopaths and um, uh, physiotherapists that are qualified to do manipulation can mani manipulate a joint or mobilize a joint or readjust a joint depending on how you're looking at it there can be a lot of manual techniques such as a trigger point release using the cupping the dry needling that will uh, address the various muscular elements uh, 
then we need exercise. Exercise to stabilise, if that's the problem, or to mobilise, rather, if we're talking about a restricted uh, joint. And exercise to basically stretch out the muscle tissue. Massage, electrotherapy, invariably a combination of all of them if, uh, it may be needed for this. Equally with a joint that's over mobile, not particularly stable, maybe the emphasis will be on the exercise point, trying to stabilise a little, little bit. But you may need to mobilise up below and above it. Often there will be trigger points in that, so you may need to relieve those. So sometimes your uh, emphasis and your criteria for treating will change according to what you've seen. And invariably we will use a combination of everything. And we may try and address it, the, some of the contributing factors, such as altering some of the biomechanical uh, problems, such as leg length uh, uh, and what have you. So... Try and bear this in mind that often this, this isn't just the case for a good old spine, but it can be for our good old shoulder or our good old neck or our good old ankle or knee problems. Look at it maybe from a different perspective, from the structure, the cause, the mechanisms of injury, how they're moving or not moving, how we need to address that, where they're moving and not moving, how we need to address that, and then we will probably come out with the optimal outcome for our clients and patients.